So my name is Corey Fleischer, and I'm the founder of the Worldwide Movement Erasing Hate. Uh, we are the first movement of its kind that targets, locates, and eliminates hate speech graffiti anywhere in the world free of charge. Now, I repeat to you, anywhere in the world free of charge. So in this talk, I'm going to basically go over where I came from, where we are right now, and where we're going on in the future. So this whole start, story started um, in grade three when I was kicked out of my elementary school. You might think that I got kicked out of my elementary school because I was fighting with kids or I was yelling at the teachers or you know, something of like that nature, but I was kicked out of my elementary school because I wasn't able to handle the three languages. See, I was diagnosed with a language processing problem. I have a learning disability that allows me to understand what you're saying to me, but it's extremely difficult for me to express myself to you guys. And in the late 90s, I'm sorry, actually in the mid 90s, there wasn't much education on how to deal with a student like me. And because of that, I floated, not only through elementary school, but through high school, lost. So in my high school of 3,000 kids, 60 kids per class, I would literally be sitting in the back of the room and I'd be listening to the teacher, but nothing was sinking in. And I graduated my high school with a 52 average. Now, a 52 average is enough to get you out of high school, but it's not enough to get you into the next school, CJEP, and if I wanted to continue with my school, I would have had to have gone to a night school. I would have had to have gone to a summer school. But luckily enough, I was a good enough uh, hockey player, or I was a good enough hockey fighter, that I got, a, uh, I got a scholarship to go to a prep school called Hebron Academy. And it's at this school that they were able to get in my head and make me understand that my greatest flaw, the biggest problem that I had going through school was actually my strongest asset. They were, were able to sit me down, understand the way that I thought, and allowed me to think outside the box. And realistically, I owe them absolutely everything. This movement stems off of the teaching of that school. Now, at the end of prep school, just like at every other school, they ask you, and this was the first time that I got asked this dreaded question, this question that plagued my life for countless amounts of years, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I had no idea. So I graduate prep school and I get into university. My first year is flying by, I'm playing hockey, everything's great. But deep down inside, I'm watching everybody start taking their classes. Everybody's interested. Everybody's going down their path. And I'm sitting in the back of the class with no direction. So first year flies by, and I keep on, you know, I keep up with my thing. I'm playing hockey. Things are great. And first year ends. Second year starts. I sit down with my guidance counselor, and she asks me, Corey, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I looked at her, and... and once again, I, I, I didn't have a response. I couldn't respond to her. And so second year, still undeclared, I floated through university. Now second semester, third year, still undeclared, I saw in the classes that there was a, a woman's studies class. And I decided that if I was gonna be in school, and I'm going to be spending my time in that place, and I might as well be around something that I was interested in, and I enrolled into a women's studies class. My first class was me, 500 women, and a 70-year-old Chinese man. <laughs> now, I'm sitting in the class, and I remember this class so vividly, and we're sitting there, and, um, you know, I'm loving my surroundings, and uh, all of a sudden, one person gets up and calls me out, and, Another person gets up and calls me out, and third, four. This guy's only in here. He's a hockey player. He's in here for the wrong reasons. 
this, is what, this isn't what this class is about. And I remember getting up and, and giving a response to that. And, and you know what? I mean, at that point in time, I decided that I was going to at least, if I was spending my time here, that I was going to prove these people wrong. And that's what I decided to uh, focus on. And then fourth year came around, and my guidance counselor sits me down, and she didn't ask me the question. I asked her the question. I said, what's the quickest way for me to get out of school? And with a big grin on her face, she looks at me, and she says, woman studies. So I graduate with a woman studies degree, and I get home here to Montreal, and I get the same question asked to me again, the same dreaded question, but this time it's my father. He sits me down, and he says, Corey, what are we going to do? What are you going to do for work? And I looked at him once again. I spent all the money. You know, he helped me out a lot. And I, I spent my own money. And I spent all my time there. And, 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 and I couldn't look at him. And I couldn't tell him that this is what we were going to do. And um, so basically in school, I was power washing. And I decided that just to pass some of the time that I was going to open up my own power washing company. And we were going to go um, through that point. And things were great. And... Um, and, you know, I'm paying my bills and I'm buying my toothpaste and paying my, for, for stuff that, you know, is allowing me to be, um, you know, on my own. But I absolutely hate my life. I, I hate my life. There is zero substance with what I'm doing. Absolutely zero substance. And so I went around a few years doing this, power washing and power washing decks. I'm power washing driveways in people's houses. I'm cleaning pigeon poop from buildings, making money, but I, I hate my life. And then one day, I'm driving downtown on a busy street. I stop at a light. I look over to the right-hand side, and on that cinder block is a swastika. Now, I wish the story was that I popped out of my truck, I whipped out my power washer, and I blasted away my first piece of hate, but that's not what happened. I kept on driving. With a crew and another truck in back of me, we headed to the, to the suburbs. It was a 30-minute drive. We get there, we're washing, and that's when I had my epiphany moment. I'm looking at everybody washing, and I said, There's, this, is, this, is, this is not what's meant to be for me. And with a quick whim of a moment, I looked at everybody, and I said, pack up, go home. You're going home on paid leave. I jumped back in my truck, and I went down to that street, and I raced my very first swastika. Now, that 15 seconds of erasing that swastika was the feeling that I was looking for my whole life. I didn't know... At that point in time, how I was going to get that again, but I knew I needed more. And that's what I would do. I would come home from work. I would jump into my truck. And now I'm driving around these city streets just looking for anything that I could erase. Just anything that I can erase. And in the first five years, I found 50. Around 10 a year. And so then, one day, I posted a few of my pictures on some of my social media, on my Instagram and on my Facebook, and my whole world got twisted and turned upside down. So we're going to go right now, I want to show you a few examples of exactly the work that we do, not only here in Montreal, but all around the world. I want to explain to you guys what we're facing, what's going on here, not necessarily in Europe or in places that are far away, but in your very own backyard. This over here was a swastika that was on the side of a Jewish family's home for 15 years. Now, the mother was a single mother with three kids, and she couldn't afford to pay for the removal. So what she decided to do is she decided to paint over this swastika. But instead of boxing it out, she just painted over the swastika and made it bigger. And not until she found out that there was a movement, a service that came and removed it for free, did she call us to have it removed. Now, I'm six foot two, 250 pounds. That swastika is bigger than me. 15 years on the side of a Jewish family's home. A little history on a swastika. Not a lot of people understand it. When I started this, I didn't know. Swastikas are thousands of years old. Even today, they're used by Hindu and Buddhist cultures as signs of good luck and peace. A lot of people think that a Nazi swastika needs to be angled. But if you'll see underneath the eagle in back of me, you'll see that it's not angled. What differentiates a Nazi swastika from all other swastikas is a white circle and black lines. Anti-Semitism, hate towards the Jewish people. In my first five years, I found 50 pieces of hate speech. On this afternoon, I erased 36-foot swastikas in under four hours. 
Now, a lot of people think swastikas only have to deal with the Jewish population, and most of the time it does, but realistically, it could be, it could be directed towards any minority. This happened uh, uh, two years ago in a garage. They came in the middle of the night, they swastikaed up the cars, they left an envelope on the windshield. In that envelope was a letter with a bullet in it, and on that letter it said that the next time this bullet's meant for your head. Now, the protocol after that happens to you is that you're supposed to get into your car, drive through the city with a huge red swastika on your car to a garage, and then pay $1,000 to have that removed. Think about how crazy that is in 2018. Now, a good percent of what we do remove is anti-Semitism, but we do remove anything. Any hate towards black communities, any hate towards Muslim communities, any hate towards the gay communities. Um, and as you'll see over here, I'm not anti-graffiti. A lot of people think that I'm anti-graffiti, but I'm not. My issue isn't with the person who put the tag underneath is hate. I have no business with them. I'm not here trying to, to, to clean the streets of graffiti. That's none of my business. My business is the hate. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to respect the artist as much as I can. And I'll just erase that hate. That's all that I need. Homophobic hate. You would think that now that we have tens of thousands of people that are following this movement all around the world, I have tens of thousands of people on my social media, that this would have been reported to me. Well, I found this myself. This is on one of the most major highways leading into this very city right here. But what I'll do is I'll step in and we'll stop that cycle of hate. I steal the voice of the haters. Islamic hate. Now, a lot of people ask me, how come I'm not removing Islamic hate? And I'm not saying that there isn't a lot of Islamic hate. But I only focus on one set of hate. I, I, I focus on the graffiti end. There's verbal, there's physical, and this is what we find. So the reports are coming in, more or less, and we're tackling everything. Now, we don't only focus on hate towards religious, uh, religious fashions, but we'll definitely go after any sort of hate. So I get a phone call, can of the day, somebody comes in from Toronto, they've seen my videos, the downtown in the most beautiful park, Victoria Park, beautiful tent set up everywhere, but on the statue, right in the middle of the park, it says, F Canada. So I, I'm in the middle of work, I drop everything, I get down there, and I quickly replace that F Canada with a Canadian flag. Three minutes, and it was gone. Now, a lot of the times, people don't understand how easy it is to have this removed, how you're able to make that difference. The only difference between me and you is that I have a power washer, some water, and drive to erase hate. That is the only difference from me sitting on the stage, everybody sitting in this audience, and everybody watching at home. A power washer, some water, and drive. This is an eight-year-old girl. I took her along with me. There was a swastika sitting in, in, in a sidewalk for 25 years in front of a family's home. I go to, I go to a home hardware store. I buy pre-mixed cement for $3. I grab an eight-year-old, gone in less than a minute. An eight-year-old girl making a bigger difference than every single person that has passed by that swastika in 25 years. Let that sink in. <laughs> I used to wear a Batman mask. <laughs> you wanna know why I wear a Batman mask? Because who's gonna tell me that I can't wear a Batman mask? <laughs> I'm 37 years old, I run around town in a Batman mask, erasing swastikas, and I have a woman studies degree. <laughs> if that doesn't prove to you that you can do whatever you want in life, then I don't know what does. Now, I got a peace medal in 2000, late 2015, early 2016, and that was great. 
But let's not talk about that medal. Let's talk about this, this ceremony that I was inducted with with 30 survivors from Auschwitz and from concentration camps. Now, I have no business being with those people. I erased graffiti. But this very moment, with that medal around me, that's when this whole thing started to be real. This is when this stopped being about me and my addiction towards erasing hate and that feeling that I chase and this being about all of you. We are all in this together. Everybody is affected by hate. Every single person that is watching this is affected by hate. And together, as one, we're able to end this. You follow me, I'll follow you. You report it to me, I'll take care of it for you, and so on and so on, and it's as easy as that. So with that all being said, after everything you've seen on here, and you see the swastikas, and you see the hate, and you see me wearing a Batman mask, this is how I want you to remember me. A shadow in the back of the streets while you guys are at work, and you guys are sleeping at night, and there are many people just like out here, just like me that are out here doing this exact same thing. This is exactly how I want you to remember me. Thank you guys very much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs>